So I start the second lecture a little bit going kind of back to what I was doing at the end of the other lecture. Uh, so I had uh, the theory, n equal to theory, when the representation R was um, L fundamental of UN. I called masses of, of those MAF, A goes from 1 to L. I had L anti-fundamental of UN with masses I called MA bar, MAF bar. Well, I cannot reach now. We have to tell that this blackboard is not moving anymore. And we had one adjoint of UN with mass M adjoint. And that was the W effective uh, the, the, as an answer. OK, so um, then there were two approaches I described. One was um, writing the vacuum equation as the critical points of W. So the equation was 1 over 2 pi i square root of minus 1 dW effective d sigma i equals n i. Um, and this equation was, in the case there, product A equals 1 to L, sigma I plus M fundamental A minus sigma, sigma I minus M fundamental bar A equals exponential of 2 pi I T product sigma i minus sigma j plus m adjoint divided by sigma i minus sigma j minus m adjoint i not equal j. And this, um, as I said, was um, uh, SL2 spin chain xxx beta equation. in case when uh, there was a relation between the parameters, and that relation was that masses should be related. MA fundamental, we have to parameterize as. So spins are denoted SA on length of the lattice L in each lattice I have spin SA, I denote it there. Uh, MA fundamental bar mass has to be my plus mu A plus ISA U, and the joint mass is denoted always minus I U. There is a reason for, for just introducing this notation. And the claim is that the, this will be impurities. These would be spins, uh, and this has a name of coupling constant. Now, important thing is, um, there was someone asked me a question, what if this uh, relation is not satisfied? I still have um, described uh, completely the vacuum of the theory, and the conjecture that we made with Nekrasa was that, um, in principle, if you would have not SL, yeah, mm, this is a case of SL2, but of course, this can be done for any spin group. 
and if it is ADE, the linking diagrams you take, you have to take ADE quiver and then AD and quiver gauge theory instead of this representation. I'm now using some words which are not important. If you are not interested, S uh, you can get, uh, instead of SL2, you would get this group spin chain. And this is doable for all of them. So what if um, the relations like that are not satisfied? Well, from gauge theory point of view, This relation came from the statement that I added that the ordinary superpotential, which was sum of following type. I took phi to the power 2SA in each lattice point. I take this representation A. I take this representation anti-fundamental. And I multiply this. And I said there is a sum with some coefficients. Let's call it MA. And I said that this will break the global group to u1 to the power 2l plus 1 if this relation is satisfied. So if this relation is not satisfied, it will completely break it down to u1. Now, from the point of view of calculation, the beta equations as a vacuum equations, it doesn't matter what kind of superpotential I add. So these relations are not necessary. So conjecture we made is that you take your spin group G and replace it by following gadget. So the Lie algebra here we will split to and we have generators um, which give us, um, let's say, E, F, and H. These are in uh, Chevalier basis. And we need cell relations. So if we cross these cell relations, this will not be the group anymore. Cell relations tell us how to take two E's and how to calculate the commutator between them. Uh, we know commutator of E's with F, so E's live here, F's live here, and H's live here. And set relation tells us how to move up on, on the, the root lattice here. So if we remove that, will be something. This is not, uh, this is a semi-infinite uh, algebra. And conjecture was made that the, uh, if... Uh, Why semi? I mean... Well, you know, it is uh, kind of... relations for E and F. Right, but see, you don't have relations between... They e make you not go too far in the... Right, but you know, it's like if you have SU3, you have E1 and E2, and you don't know what is their commutator. Right, so, so without that relation, it's not a Lie algebra anymore. No, it is. Yes, it's, it's, it's a free. Algebra. It's a free Lie algebra. It's a free Lie algebra. It has ideals and things like that. And the ideal, so it's a, the, the statement is it's the original. Yeah. yeah. So the statement is okay. Thank you for asking me like that. Statement is that the center. Let's call the Casimir sort of, still exists. So you, you still can co construct out of um, th this freely algebra something which will be uh, uh, in the center. And that's all the, all the commutes with uh, the, the, the Casimirs, commutes with everything. And those things are actually not necessary to have cell relations. This is my understanding. In order to write the center. So center still exists without cell relations. Why I'm making this comment here maybe not very relevant, is that see, if these relations are not satisfied, I still have some integrable system. And this integrable system will not be spin chain. Because in order to be spin chain, these relations should be satisfied. Conjecture was, yeah, it will be some chain where we put not the representations uh, like we would do for, um, uh, uh, if we would have a spin chain with the Lie algebra representation sitting there, but we would change the algebra to the freely, free al freely algebra and still will be integrable system. But in order to be integrable system, you need Hamiltonians which commute. 
So you need these Casimirs, which are out of which you are constructing the integrable system. Anyway, this was side comment, by the way. So please don't pay attention to it. The statement is that this is a way of describing vacua in the case when we have this kind of superpotential. Uh, this kind of superpotential, we get the exact identification between known spin chains and um, the so vacuo of supersymmetric gauge theory. Now I want to Sorry, move on. Can I just ask, so there are as many SAs as and, and mu A's as MA F and MA bar, so can't you always invert this relation? What, what is the uh, MS? No, there are complex numbers. All of them are complex, and these are reals. This has to be half integer. But, but why? I mean, you can take Bowman modules for. No, no, that's here, yeah, but this cannot, you cannot write field in the power of complex number. So I, I have restriction here related to that this is half integer. Well, basically the statement is that we want to have a polynomial Hamiltonian, a po polynomial um, action in the two-dimensional gauge theory, and that's the restriction. That's not arbitrary. Well, there was a time when we were interested. What is the situation when the relations are not satisfied? And there was some conjecture. I probably forgot it. Huh? I want to move on to the two important uh, topics. One is the description here that I presented on the blackboard. Well, these operators OIs were traces of uh, scalar uh, in the vector multiple that I call sigma. And this is not very invariant description. So more invariant description would be if I would consider uh, the order parameter which gives me uh, inv invariant description under the permutation of indices. And that would be, we, will, we called it Baxter churn. order parameter. And q of x is uh, simply determinant of x minus sigma, which is same as product. Sigma is a matrix here. After we diagonalize it, introduce the notation of the diagonal eigenvalues, it's product of uh, uh, product like this, which is the same as if I would write x to the power n plus sum i equals 1 to n minus 1 to the power i ci x to the power n minus i, where ci's now are invariant observables, invariant under action of Weyl group. OK, so this is a now object I would be for a second interested. And obviously, if I learn something about this guy, I learn about this also because they are some linear combinations. They are already in included there. OK, so now the theorem is simple one. And everybody who does the um, beta that knows this, this uh, equation uh, with a notation a of x equals product and d of x, another product I'll construct it out of masses, is equivalent to the statement that following vacuum identity, I would wish to call it a word identity, but at the moment it's a vacuum identity. which means that I have to evaluate that between vacuum state, because Q is operator, Be, uh, following I get satisfied. Ax of Q, x plus m adjoint, plus exponential of 2 pi i t, d of x. This is important identity that I need to use later, so I would have to write it at least once equals t of x times q of x, where t is some degree l polynomial. Which 
which well, has no relation with the parameter t. By the way, the value of t is uh, arbitrary. What a t of x is some degree. No, there is a t in the phase also. Oh, this is not related. It's not related. And t is arbitrary. This Let me call theta whatever. It's arbitrary complex number. And it was introduced. It was this um, theta term and phi Leopoldus term was. Okay, this theta was called before t, and it was for every uh, u1 element of the group. I had such thing, which was theta a plus i r a. This was theta term, which multiplies trace of f. Uh, and this was uh, phi Leopoldus term which somehow enters there. So th this is here, and it's actually, well, I don't like to call this thing. Okay, let me call it, let me call this exponential 2 pi i t to be q. So I will call this guy now q. So I get this equation, and uh, um, this is claimed to be vacuum identity now. How does it work? We have Q, which is polynomial, but I don't have to restrict it. I mean, in this particular problem, it turned out to be Q to be polynomial of degree n. It turned out that the T was polynomial of degree L, and this equation, which is written here, is a uh, for Baxter equation, this is called Baxter equation integrable models. Statement is following. So we are looking for the solution of this Baxter equation in polynomials of degree n. And the beta equation is a consistency condition that it's t of x is degree l polynomial. So combine these two equations, basically completely describe in spin, spin the chain language the spectrum of this theory, because the coefficients of expansion of t here will be Hamiltonian. So there will be sum over i, and this will be spin chain Hamiltonians. Now, later in the probably next week, uh, I will write similar equations when Q will not be uh, in uh, space of polynomials like it is here. And this uh, statement still will be correct. But by now, what we keep in mind is that two dimensional n equals 2, comma 2 theory of special type on many of them and so on do, does describe inter quantum integrable systems. such that we know the place of Baxter equation, which is a vacuum identity for this baxter churn um, observable order parameter. And we know beta equations as critical points of W effective. So this is an information we gathered by doing these two-dimensional field theories, two-dimension n equal to comma two theories. Baxter equation is a vacuum identity for order parameter Q of x, which is written like this. And uh, beta equation are critical points of twisted effective superpotential. And as I said, this is true for any n equals two theory in two dimensions for any representation. The trick is that the, uh, changing the representation, we are changing our quantum integrable system. So when I take gauge theory with different representation to be a matter sector, so different flavor group, different quarks, and so on I add, in a vacuum sector, I will get a different quantum integrable system, but it always will be some quantum integrable system. The good thing happened um, in this kind of game was that if I wanted to get SL2 speed chain, Turned out that something very basic, something very simple, some simple gauge theory would describe that. If I would want to get G2 uh, um, 
uh, spin chain and so on, I probably don't know. <laughs> but if I want to get anything that is in A, D, and E series, I can. Just have to take a quiver. Probably G2 is also possible, right? Or an anything. OK, now I want to move to. This is a, this comes with a solution. So I have to say. So Bach's equation has two solutions. One is polynomial, second actually is also polynomial in this case. And can you give an interpretation of second solution? Okay. The solution I get is what is written here. One. When I want to get the other solutions, I have to change the problem. And I it's my I lectures. Of course, yeah. This one gives me solutions that I wrote like here. OK, so now I want to erase this and speak a little bit about, so this, this is information we keep in mind. Now I want to move in topological quantum field theory language a little bit and explain the same things. Yes. Uh, yeah. What does the beta equation buy you? Um, it's a condition for, right? Not every sigma, not every sigma corresponds to vacuum. Only those that solve this equation corresponds to the vacuum state. In a spin chain language means that the, you write the Hamiltonian as functions of sigma, like I wrote there. Uh, the hi's are expressed in terms of sigma after you expand the t. And so h's are, Hamiltonians are functions of sigma. And uh, the formula you get over there are the values of Hamiltonians, but you have to evaluate them for sigma solving this solution. Otherwise, it will not be eigenvalue. Because the Petit equation, if I recall, is a, it's a multiple scattering. It's a, saying the phase. We, uh, we are not there in that language. This is kind of, you know, there are many ways of understanding beta equation. And uh, uh, at the moment, statement is following. You have h of sigma, so you parameterize energies, let's call it E actually, because we are already in. A so there are formula for energies in terms of sigma, and this will be a spectrum in a spectrum of the quantum integrable system only if sigma satisfies this equation. Now, how did it come in a gauge theory language? I explained. If it's not a critical point of the, this W effective, then it has nothing to do with the vacuum. Now, how did it come in a quantum integrable system? Another lecture, okay? It's a complicated, long lecture. What right now, we identify these two things. And now we want to play game, what, do, what can we learn out of it, right? Because see, I'm not going to repeat what people quantum integrable system do, and moreover, I'm not the expert of doing that, but we'll, what we learn about that, and how can we use the knowledge to, to expand things. So now I want to move to the topological quantum field theory language, keeping this knowledge. So somehow forget all these things now, except the facts I wrote over there. And a uh, little bit digress to topological quantum field theory language. In topological quantum field theory, I, sa I said that the uh, standard law has been that partition function of topological quantum field theory which is trace minus 1 to the power f exponential of minus beta h minus sum ti oi oi are our chiral ring operators uh, is equal to trace of minus 1 to the power f exponential of minus ti oi only in a vacuum sector. So that's how vacuum sector and topological quantum field theory are connected. And this was trace of exponential of minus ti hi, where now it is in some quantum mechanics. So from what we just described, it looks like that the, when we had a cylinder, so topological quantum field theory can be defined on any Riemann surface of genus uh, G and, and punctures and, and, and boundaries and so on. This is defined for any. But now we restrict to cylinder and close the cylinder when you compute a partition function. So this is torus. And that's a trace in the quantum mechanics. Now, um, 
what we claimed basically was that topological quantum fields are associated to our supersymmetric gauge theories. The quantum will, will be this. We will have some there over solutions of the beta equation. Solutions of beta equations, which, which are written there, of exponential of minus ti, where we write this hi as a function of sigma. And depending, I mean, we can put any, any basis there. We can take, for example, hi to be this guy. So. Or we can take hi. It always will be true. This statement is always true. We have to sum over that. What if I would take arbitrary Riemann surface? Not, uh, not the cylinder. Calculation is still possible. And for arbitrary Riemann surface, the following nice formula can be derived. Again, it's generic to any n equal to comma to theory. Um, yeah. uh, I have a question. Uh, how did the minus 1 to the power? It disappeared because when we come here, this theory has nothing to do with supersymmetric theory. This, this usually is a guess. This usually we have to guess. But uh, there were a uh, couple of examples known when this guess was possible to do. And the one was uh, Ed Witten's paper on 2D Young Mills Revisited. Uh, when he wrote this as a sum of the characters and representations of the unitary groups and so on. I mean, there was, this is probably the second guess was uh, a similar one was what we called two-dimensional Young-Mills-Higgs theory, which is um, part of the story here. I, I will say something about it. So, but uh, in general, this kind of, that's what you think, that our topological quantum field theory is actually finitely many degrees of freedom, so it's quantum mechanics. But it does not have to be supersymmetric quantum mechanics. It starts as a supersymmetric theory, and at this point, as I just showed, it's a spin chain, very supersymmetric in them, if there are no fermions. OK, so now what I... Uh, um, what is the f how h depends on sigma in that formula is completely relevant. It's never used. I mean, you just take any basis of this O's, this will be still true. The so important part is that the sum will be over solutions. What gets summed up now, I move to, when you move to the higher genus, there is a prefactor here, and then the, the importance comes. But on the torus, that's just the sum. OK, so I wanted to write a general formula for any Riemann surface. Somehow, I find the similar thing as Maxim said last week, that it's easier to give these lectures in one week when you don't forget what you were talking about before. And also, when the audience is the same. <laughs> it doesn't change constantly. <laughs> it's a different people, then it's complicated. OK, so general formula for topological theory is like that. As I said, I defined what was a physical theory. Everything was explicitly defined. And I also explained last time a couple of type of twists that one can do. But the formula I write is true for any of them. The uh, topological partition function is this one. This h, by the way, has not, this is h of n equal to theory. It's not related to h as I write there. Uh, so it's a sum over certain set of function h sigma belonging to that set to the power g minus 1. So this is for Riemann surface of genus g. Uh, exponential minus sum ti oi sigma b again. See, it doesn't matter uh, what o's are, such that b solves the, b, the set b is a solution to our beta equation. And H of sigma has actually a name. I will introduce it in a second. 
this is equal exponential of minus certain function. This is a new function that I have to explain what it is. Determinant of two derivatives of this effective twisted superpotential times the Vandermonde. So delta of sigma is um, positive roots scalar product. So that's basically a Vandermonde. So what is H? H has a name. It is called the Handel gluing operator. As you see, when genus equals 1, it is not there. So h to the power g minus 1 is uh, uh, 1. And that's why h is called Handel gluing operator, that every time you add the handle, you get more, one more h. So let's introduce this handel gluing operator. So remember that I had O's satisfying the OPEs. Plus Q of something. And uh, what is CABC, obviously, is, is uh, the, these constants are independent of what genus we are on, and the, uh, I can write the formula for that by fixing three points on a sphere. And calculating it um, as a three-point correlation function. Now I can define a special metric, let's call it topological metric. So C is we defined on a sphere three-point function. Topological metric which will be, I pick that particular state that I spent some time talking about during the lunch, and take CAB times 0. So 0 would correspond to, basically, to spin operator. Now, this topological metric has a property that um, CAB, eta AB, eta BC is uh, normalized where I write now C with a low upper index to use this metric from my three-point function. OK. So this defines canonically a following element. And I call this element h. It's purely written in terms of the constants which are on the blackboard, by the way. So h is metric, our three-point function, and operator. So this, op this thing can be written as a also as a two-point function, because we have the metric which was defined in terms of the three-point function. So this is, again, similar thing, as same thing as eta AB, OA dot OB. That's it. So if we don't put in the exponential these TIOIs and just calculate for T equals 0, then this T Z topological, these are very known and old formulas. The Z topological on genus G at t equals 0 will be just sum, or I can write trace, of this operator into the power G minus 1. And that's why that formula is true. So that relates handle gluing operator. Uh, in abstract description with a particular formula I wrote here, and now I have to say what is u0, and I am finished. In order to describe what u0 is, I have to remind you that this topological quantum field theory comes with its action, and topological action always comes 
uh, under descent procedure from our effective twisted pot superpotential. So if we calculate in a physical theory effective twist superpotential, then corresponding topological action which is defined explicitly in terms of this guy, I give you an example and it will be clear, plus there is two derivatives with fermions, And there is a dilatonic term when I have to write now, since I'm on arbitrary Riemann surface, sigma, I have a two-dimensional scalar curvature which can be coupled to some scalar function of sigma and that's what I wrote, denoted by u0. So in a physical theory you calculate W effective twilda, but if you have in a card space there will be coupling also of this type and you have to calculate what u0 is. And U0, as we see, enters in a formula for handle gluing operators there. Now, this is generic action, and it's easy to show why any action is like that. Take a symmetric polynomial I of um, scalar in the vector multiplet. So vector multiplet here has A, Psi, and the sigma. So I take any symmetric polynomial, or actually doesn't have to be polynomial, any function which is invariant under all symmetries of transformations of the field. So since sigma is an adjoint representation, it's adjoint invariant function on the cartan of, uh, of the Lie algebra. And then the claim is that um, under the transformations, uh, supersymmetry transformation or transformations under Q charge, that we kept and we kept QA, I can descend, I can take derivative of this, will be Q of something, let's call it 1, I can take this one, take derivative of them, will be Q of something, call it 2, and this 2 is a 2 form, because I acted by derivative twice, right? That Q has a property, well, that, that 2 is a 2 form and it's a perf perfect Lagrangian. I can integrate 2 form over 2 surface and this will be my S. Now, this S will depend on, will be functional of sigma, psi, and A. And it will satisfy all the uh, requirements that uh, we need to have in uh, uh, topological quantum field theory. Only thing with is a question what is i, and i gets calculated after abelianization from our physical theory, or call it uv theory. So we have uv theory, we integrate out all possible things and so on, and we get uh, uh, some action in infrared. And whatever we get will have this form. So only thing is to find i. And i, I just said that it's a W effective and that term is necessary also to be calculated. Okay. So i is the action of the origin. I, I will do it I will do the example. So in the simplest possible case, answering Thibault's question, i is trace of sigma square. Right? It's a simple simple uh, adjoint invariant function on the, on the group, on, on the Lie algebra where sigma lives, right? So well, let's, if when you do two the descents, you get uh, this two, the what I call two, to be sigma times f plus psi psi. See? This is two form, this is scalar, this is two form psi psi, right? In general, you will get this but in simplicity you get that. And this is a starting point of description of two-dimensional uh, topological theories that Ed Witten introduced called two-dimensional topological young mill theory. So let me show just to, I, I feel like there are some knowledge I'm skipping and jumping up and down. So let's take that guy and let me very quickly hook up the two-dimensional young mill theory out of it, so the simplest. So we have now two observable, which is trace sigma f plus psi wedge psi. 
right? So now we add observable. As I said, one of the O's can be, uh, let's say, G over 2 trace sigma square. This is uh, one of those TIOIs, right? I pick one T, which I call G, and I picked O, one O, to be trace sigma square. It's perfectly uh, uh, allowed observable. This doesn't interact with anything, so this is important for the measure. But now we have an action trace sigma f minus sig g over 2 trace sigma square. It's quadratic in sigma. You can integrate out sigma, and you get this important, this multiplies volume form on sigma, because the trace sigma square is scalar. This is two form. You integrate this is scalar. You have to multiply by volume form. Basically, square root of g, the square root of metric, the determinant of metric. So if we integrate out sigma, it is uh, 1 over 2g squared f wedge star f, right? So this theory is equivalent to this theory in two dimensions, right? So by studying that kind of construction, I, I study this theory. Now, in general, I can add, as it's written there, minus ti trace sigma in any power i more than 3. It's still calculable. I mean, I will be able to calculate everything in this theory. And if I calculate pass integral of all fields in this theory, in particular, I, I calculate in this one. So the uh, Young-Mills coupling constant, which stands here, is not a unique one. There are many others. So all are equally good. This just happened to be that something we like. So now statement is that whatever theory will, you will start with in ultraviolet, so you give me this n equal 2 comma 2 super young mill theory with lots of matter and so on, when you will do all this machinery that I've been explaining, so on, you will get some theory in lo some low energy theory which will be functional of abelian components of your original group. This is what I call sigma i's and f's and so on. And the statement is, it always will have this form. There is no other option because of the arguments playing with the supercharges and so on. Okay? Only thing you have to calculate W effective. And I said W effective here is the same as twist effect superpotential in the physical description I had before. It, these are same objects. The U0 of sigma is separately needs to be calculated because it's, uh, it it's only appears when you have a card space in two dimensions. OK. So, sir, it doesn't have anything to do with term time? It does has. Uh, it's now the opens a new, 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 new door to my lectures. And I mean, um, it's I'm sensitive. As everything has every OK. So now, in two dimensions, so this is our action, S top, which is written there. In two dimensions, there is no uh, uh, degree of freedom for the gauge field. So only degree of freedom, if you have a Riemann surface of genus G, only you can have is, uh, let's take torus again. Let's go to the torus. So I write now the topological action for torus as a function of uh, x and the sigma, where x is monodromy of the gauge field over S1. This is our torus. And let's take i's component of the gauge field, because we have many u1 gauge fields. And this is xi. So the action actually is a functional of uh, monodromy of the gauge field, scalar, and the fermion zero modes, because the rest of this thing disappears. It's um, independent of points and everything, uh, this action. So what is uh, the? Uh, Type, type of detection, it's nothing more but the quantum mechanics with pi xi dot, where pi is conjugate to this xi and is equal dw effective twilda d sigma i. Okay. Take this, multiply by time derivative of z, what you get, this is equal, this is why I wrote integral over sigma, in this case torus, of uh, dw d sigma i times fi, which now I write as d of ai. And the only time derivative I keep here, there is no space dependence. 
I take already integral over S1. So I get that this section, which is written over there, is equal px dot. Right? Is this clear? Uh, it's two-dimensional. There are no degrees of freedom. Only monodromy is care. I wrote this apex. So, and this, this is a time direction here. Is uh, also integral over the time. And since it's a torus, it's also periodic. Then there is another term which multiplies fermions. And this is important that the fermions come with this term. So fermionic path integral will give that determinant, which is written there, d2, w effective, d sigma i, d sigma j. This term will give exponential of minus 2 u0 in h. And the van der Mond is obvious, because I'm integrating over matrices. I diagonalize the matrices. I get van der Mond determinant. So I'm explaining to each term. Van der Mond is clear. The determinant of two derivatives of w effective in positive power comes because it's a fermionic integral over psi, and it's a positive power. Then there is a exponential of minus 2 times u0 of sigma, which comes from r2 times u0 of sigma there, uh, uh, written in, in the last term. And the only important thing now is that see, this term, px dot, is defined, x is defined up to shift by 1, because I'm on a circle. And uh, uh, monodromy, when I go, I, I, go the, I do large U1 gauge transformation, Xi will be shifted by, uh, by 1. Each Xi will be shifted by 1. So Xi's live on a circle. And if Xi's live on a circle, then Pi's should be integers. Right? Because I have X quantum mechanics when X lives on a circle, then conjugate momenta should be integer. And Pi equals integer is this equation. Okay? The moment I calculate that topological action, it's which is written on that blackboard, how I calculate is a different story. I know that the answer will be sum over solutions of pi equals integer. But now pi equals integer is complicated. In two-dimensional Young Mills, which was somewhere here on the blackboard, over there, pi equals integer meant that sigma is equal integer. And sigma equals integer in two-dimensional Young Mills was interpreted that we have sum over highest weight representations of unitary group which are labeled by set of integers. So this set of integers in two-dimensional Young Mills interpreted as a representation uh, as an instance of integral and all these kind of things. These were highest weights of the individual unitary representation. Now this relation sigma equals n gets replaced by complicated one, dw d sigma equals n. So meaning of dw d sigma equals n, very important, is the same as their highest weight representation. So we have deformation somehow of the, of the theory of, of the highest weight representations. And moreover, it's not only that, but also, uh, Okay, we will get to it. So the beta equation, uh, I, I will now do the Hitchin example quickly, and uh, we will see that the, in topological theory of modulized integral of modulized space of Hitchin, uh, that's actually direct meaning. Okay, so for one second, I want to show that the vacua don't have to be, and now I'm coming to your question, vacua don't have to be finite dimensional. OK, this is the case when I have uh, the, uh, the Baxter operator, which is not polynomial. Okay. Well, that case is on most of polynomials. The second solution is constructible from the first solution from the Ronsky, and I don't want to go there. OK, well, at the moment, I want to first write the polynomial one, and then I move to the case when it's not polynomial. And then I claim that the first important statement will be there is a Baxter equation, and solve it in each space you like, and for each solution, there will be uh, an interpretation in a gauge theory. Instead of going to the negative spins, uh, the, the, the negative powers of the uh, 1 over polynomial, I, I will do. My, my plan of the presenting this thing is a little bit uh, organized on the way that I 
first study everything which is uh, what I call compact situation and then non-compact. So I said that um, XXX pin chain was n equals 2 comma 2 two-dimensional su supersymmetric gauge theory with some finite dimensional representation R, which was reducible, but some, some representation. The first thing we need to, I need to explain is that I can be asked, what if I want to get yeah, so what I can do with XX pin spin chain, I can change the gauge group, and I said what, sorry, I can change the spin group. Let me write here spin group G. I can change spin group, I can change some parameters, but eventually XXX means uh, restriction already. What if I want to do XXZ spin chain? Well, answer is, <coughs> we have to take this representation to be infinite dimensional. And specifically, we have to take n equals to three dimensional super Young Mill theory on a cylinder times S1 with the radius r. And now, the n equal to three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory on this thing is the same as uh, this one, uh, two-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory. But when the representation r is sum of r n's, where n is a kaluza klein mod. So what is this thing? Take this three-dimensional theory. Expand every field in three-dimensional theory, let's call it field phi, uh, so this was in three dimensions, any field, expand like that, you have now infinitely many kaluza klein modes phi, phi, phi n, and in terms of the phi n, this three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory is actually two-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory. It's easy to count what are the number of supercharges. It will be same number of supercharges. But the representation R now will be same as before, but each field gets a label, this n. And we have to watch what is, um, this label does. And the statement is, that this label does that each field phi will have twisted mass proportional to that thing, which is a kaluza klein mass. And that kaluza klein mass is a twisted mass. And it's clear, actually, that now global group, global symmetry group, from two-dimensional point of view, contains shifts. in X3, right? We, this theory is three-dimensional, and in three-dimensional theory on a circle, we have a symmetry of shifting in X3. And from two-dimensional point of view, this is a global symmetry group. This is a group which acts on the space of fields, right? When you shift X, your fields transform. And uh, uh, for e each global group, th now this is affine, right? Because this is a... Uh, affine shift. So now uh, your masses are associated to that. Uh, the, uh, ev everything is a previous story. So we completely come back, come back to previous story, except uh, we have infinitely many representations. And the claim is that the anisotropy is proportional to R. Actually, when anisotropy goes to 1, R goes to 0. Right? 
So when R goes to zero, you go back to two-dimensional theory. There is its dimensional reduction. There are no kaluza klein modes. That two-dimensional theory we already studied, and we proved that it was XXX. Right? I said that the two-dimensional theory with 2 comma 2 supersymmetry is giving me X, 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 X pin chain, set of XXX X, X pin chain, depending what matter sector I take there. This one will give me back to this when I send radius to zero, which means that the XXZ has to go to XXX. That explains it. And this has been proven, actually. Then this is true. And W effective has been calculated for this. And for XX uh, and coincides with the young young function for XXE. Now I introduce word young young function. I will talk about this a little bit. XYZ model, now it's obvious, right? You have to consider four dimensional theory on a cylinder times two torus. Two torus has a one modular moduli tau, which is a complex one, and it's expressed in terms of the anisotropies uh, of XXZ, XYZ. XYZ has two real parameters, which are uh, anisotropies, and these two real parameters are parameterized, by the way, in a Fadeev Tartajan description of paper 1979, in terms of the torus, tau. And that's exactly the same tau that uh, these two torus will have uh, in four dimensions. And this four dimensional theory on a cylinder times T2 is again R, which is infinite dimensional, now double sum. Uh, of um, on these two torus, and uh, we uh, included, uh, we allowed such infinite dimensional representations when we were studying two dimensional cell. Okay, again, W effective can be calculated, which will be now again double sum over these double Kaluza Klein modes, and it coincides with Yang Yang function of XX, XYZ model. That has been proven. Now, what is Yang-Yang function? Yang-Yang function is that for every, I mean, this is very hard. For every quantum integrable system, every quantum integrable system we know, except what is called n equal 4 integrability the beta equation is always critical equation for some function what integrability people call the young young function so beta equation is an equation on some number of variables Okay, there are as many uh, uh, equations as number of variables. So we can write always the beta equation in quantum integrable system as an equation on zeros of one form. Suppose beta equations were bi of some lambdas equals zero, where lambdas is a set of lambda i's, so there are as many lambdas as equations, we construct out of it one form in R whatever dimension of space is, call it B lambda. And in every example, except this n equal 4 integrability that some of you have been working on, there is an observation that db equals 0, or locally, and this is all locally, of course, we are talking about b i of lambda is d of y d lambda i. And this has been observed in every known example, except, again, 
the solution to n equal 4 super young mills, the integrable system that people constructed for that. Okay, and uh, as I just explained here, what has been proven case by case was that um, W effective of uh, uh, super young mill theory coincides with the uh, young function with just blunt identification sigma equals lambda w effective of sigma equals y of lambda. That plus m sigma, right? Plus m sigma. Sir. It's included in young function. I included. Oh, you're right. I don't include it in y now, so let me see. Uh, so I don't include it in y. It's my equation says bi is equal to pi square root of minus 1 ni. Okay. So I have to include it this kind. OK. So on, on moreover, yes, and moreover, the H Hamiltonians of uh, the OIs of sigma of the gauge theory, these observables I said, uh, 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 were identified with HIs energies uh, for the quantum Hamiltonians that people calculate. And this is defined in a quantum integrable system. Just the convenient thing that the people parameterize eigenvalues in terms of some uh, parameters lambda, which they find in many different ways. And then there is a statement that the vacuum expectation value of these operators are uh, coincide with energies. So this has been verified case by case. There is no complete theory that we could say that we understand everything, and that's what we are looking for. So now I want to consider, so I listed these things because I can't spend time concentrating on this, but this one I hope I explained. Now I want to consider <coughs> the simplest possible case when we have both topological quantum field theory description and some interesting Schrodinger operators that I, I think are worth discussing. OK, let's go back to two dimensions. Forget this kind of x, y, z, and so on, and consider the, my old example, which was called main example, except I will take L to be equal to 0, which means I consider just representation to be one adjoint of un. And I call that one adjoint to be phi. So now I have n equal to theory in two dimensions. And I add, so pure n equal to, which means just gauge multiplet, pure n equal to, plus I add one adjoint. And I made it, made it massive. This has a name that we will be using later. These kind of theories are called n equal to star theories. So n equal to star theories are n equal to theories plus one adjoint, one adjoint massive uh, multiplet. It's the same name. It's called in four dimensions. It's called n equal four. Now, there is another property that these kind of theories have. These theories are also n equal four theories. So they have twice as many supercharges. Uh, I mean that they are n equal four theory in terms of the field content. So they have same field content as uh, n equal four theories. Then for G theory, you had uh, n equals one symmetry, n equals one, uh, one supercharges in x, y, z. Okay. Yeah. So this theory, x, y, z is n equal one in 4D. Yes, this is such theory that when you go down to torus, you get n equal two. Yeah. And this, by, by the way, has strange name. It's n equal to in 3D again. 
A question. If you take a 4D theory, but put it not on a torus, but on an arbitrary human surface, what you get into the torus, what integral system? Only thing I do is like this. I go dimensional reduce first. And in dimensional reduction, I identify what type of theory I can have. And then I say that if I now have toroidal Kaluza Klein mode, that they are one to one correspondent to XYZ. If they are not toroidal but some sigma, it's still some integrable system. But I don't know what name of that. Uh, it wouldn't have Young and function because if, 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 if you have structure similar to n equals 4, you have Why? like those. Um, cuts on uh, spectral variable. Well, the spectral variable in the case of XYZ is not just on the curve. Sigma lies right. on the curve. But if you take some random Riemann surface, you will lose uh, the piece of the curve. You will have a curve, but uh, not additive structure. And uh, that's the case when you don't have young end function. So maybe that's a way to understand. Uh, well, this contradicts to the other notion that if I take that theory in four dimensions, the um, twist effective superpotential in two dimensions still will be there. That theory will have. Theory, four, uh, four dimensional theory. N equals one? N equals one, yeah. It will still have it. Probably I have to take, to make very clear, is that let's take uh, all these theories, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about are in four dimensions, N equals twos broken uh, uh, by hand to N equals one. So these are the. X, Y, Z is, yeah, I don't have to add trace sigma right. square, right, right. So the suggestion is to study this theory on property part, not on the... That's a good point, actually. That's a good, good point. Maybe, l let's talk about that, you know. I'm getting a bit tired, so let me wrap it up to some point so I will make a break. It's quite possible. Actually, what I'm not sure is that if I take arbitrary Riemann surface, if I can interpret it is, uh, yeah, I, I need all the guys to be massive. I, I need everything to be massive. Yes, yeah. they would be massive. There are PT modes, they are just not as massive. They are, they are exp not in Fourier modes, they are expanding. Yeah, yeah. By the way, the, there is an important thing that the people who do XYZ model know, that the beta ansatz that Tartajan and Fade wrote for XYZ model uh, uh, is an equation of that type that was written here. and. Uh, it has to satisfy certain modular properties. So there is this statement about X, Y, Z spin chain that the beta equations are some modular function, uh, the, the ratio of theta functions. And it does not really satisfy modularity property unless the beta roots, I think, sum up to zero or something. So there is a condition that beta roots should sum up to zero and then the left-hand side is modular, right-hand side is modular. You see, instead of, instead of product, instead of product of sigma i minus sigma j plus m or something, we have theta functions now. And they are in characteristic and something. And the, uh, when, you, when you rewrite the equations I was writing, there is some problem with modularity, which is related to the facts in x, y, z model uh, uh, the, the uh, ground state uh, actually needs to be uh, constructed a, a, as some linear combination with some theta term of the uh, usual ground states, that like constructed by BBBB acting of B operators. Uh, and that modularity property that I just said about the for the, uh, the uh, this beta equation uh, that, I if I remember correctly, if you write in this uh, language of the beta roots, sum of sigma i's have to be zero. There is such condition there. And it's very easy to retranslate this to x, y, z model on these times torus uh, being, n equ being n equal one zero in four dimensions on that time torus, if you start uh, uh, putting fluxes on T2. So you can put, for example, two form flux on T2 and so on, and write the general theory on there. And uh, uh, the condition of modularity, as far as I remember, is equivalent to condition 
of uh, anomaly freed freedom in this four, dim four dimensional gauge theory when you have background fields. And background fields, I mean, fluxes on this T2, P field like. You can put a B field, two form field, any background field. And they have meanings in the XYZ model. So it's entire new subject actually about any this, this XYZ being n equal to 1 for D, which goes like this. You observe something on a cylinder times torus, and you are happy. And now you start playing with four-dimensional theory on a cylinder times torus. And you want to explain everything in terms of the XYZ model, and lots of interesting things happen. And that's un not studied by anybody. I, I don't know anybody studying it. Okay, so now let's make a, let me consider now. We have n equal four theory, and we can construct actually many many things uh, in general. We can take theories which look n equal two but are really n equal four, and then break n equal four down by uh, uh, something down to n equals two. And in this particular case, this is done by adding. Uh, uh, superpotential, what I will call bare superpotential, W tilde of sigma, which is one half trace sigma square. And I'll now remind uh, uh, this was the answer for Thibault. I somewhere here, yes, here, I said that two-dimensional Young-Mills was like that. So two-dimensional Young-Mills was, let's see, I added by hand trace sigma square. And that was Witten's explanation that the two-dimensional, uh, ordinary two-dimensional Young-Mills actually uh, has to have this term to be the two-dimensional Young-Mills. And that's what I would do here also. So I would take now, instead of Witten taking n equal two theory and adding trace sigma square, I would take n equal four theory, give the mass and add uh, one half trace sigma square, and I will have the group UN. So my question is, what is this theory now? Obviously, it's not an XXX spin chain because I don't have, I have zero lengths completely. I, I don't have a spin chain. But there is something. And let's see what that something is. And that something, of course, we determine, detect by calculating its beta equations, its vacuum equations. And what, once we look on vacuum equations, we ask the question, so wh where we have seen this vacuum equation? Th there are lots of uh, other questions people can ask, and uh, I can try to answer, like, yes, you construct spin chain, but did you construct the spin itself? Or you make a statement that the spectrum of the spin chain Hamiltonian is the same as the spectrum of the vacuum of that gauge theory. That's the statement I made. Now, Didina can come and tell me, oh, I want to see the spin. Where is the spin? There is no spin. Or you can do intricate construction in two-dimensional gauge theory to actually see the spin. And that's doable. But I'm not describing it here. It's very intricate, and it's actually possible to actually see the spin. OK, so the beta equation now in that model, which is written there, which is n equal 4 plus mass for a joint plus 3 level potential, the equation will be exponential of i sigma j is equal product from i equals 1 to n sigma i minus sigma j plus m divide sigma i minus sigma j minus m. And here I would stop uh, in, uh, so I would say now what it is, this is called uh, n particle sector. So now I detect it. I wrote the beta equation, vacuum equation. Now I know for which, which integrable system it says. M particle sector of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is quantum field theory actually in two dimensions, in one plus one dimensions. But I restrict it to the N particle sector, so it becomes quantum mechanical. And in that n particle sector, it's described by this. And it also, in that n particle sector, uh, has a quantum mechanical description in terms of something looking like that. Take n particles x1 to xn, living on a circle. So I have n particles on a circle. 
with the Hamiltonian to be minus one half sum from one to n d over d x i square plus c times sum i not equal j delta function of x i minus x j and that c is uh, m equals i c. Okay, so this is an identification. This is a known beta equation for n particle sector of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is equivalent to n particles on a circle with a Schrodinger operator being like this. So if c equals zero, these are just n free particles on a circle. And when c equals zero, this should be uh, two-dimensional Young Mills, right? The way I constructed. So two-dimensional Young Mills is this problem. When c is not zero. But it's not zero. So it's a deformation of two-dimensional Young Mills. The two-dimensional Young Mills actually corresponds to c goes to infinity. But when I come back, I describe. So now we are dealing with a situation where there are infinitely many vacua. It's a finite dimension. It, it's a two-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory with finitely many fields but has infinitely many supersymmetric vacua because everybody knows that this system has infinitely many solutions. This beta equation has infinitely many solutions. So when I come back, I will be start with this and connect it to the Hitchin system and that will be my way to move to Hitchin system from the second half of this lecture and next, next week. I'm very sorry, today was a little bit gra uh, kind of jumping around because you know, when you finish in one place and you come back and you realize that these are different people and they forgot what we were talking about last week, it's disaster. I mean, how can I warm up to get to these formulas? I don't know. Okay, in 15, 10 minutes maybe we come back, 10, 15 minutes. First thing we know that we can ask the question, over which moduli space we integrate in this case. And I now remind that there was a generally, I wrote the uh, BPS equations. which looked like we take this connection A, construct the curvature, and there was something here which depended on complex conjugate uh, superpotential and so on, but this all this is zero, except we have this, uh, the one field in a joint representation, which I call phi. And uh, what was in right-hand side in this VP equa VPS equation will be just commutator of phi z with phi z bar. And then there was an equation also what was nabla z bar of any chiral multiplet that I had in a matter sector, and now I have only this in a matter sector, and that will be this equation. So these are the BPX equation we are integrating over in a gauge theory in that setup. General equation I probably write now on that blackboard I had in the last lecture and uh, although people are not here, uh, maybe if someone watches on over the internet uh, can be useful. So general equations was for every matter multiplet, which I denoted by x, there was a BPS equation, the topologically twisted theory was integral over or equivalently the vacuum sector of the physical theory uh, defined. And this was dz bar, okay, this is nabla I call now, nabla z bar of A acting on xi in a matter sector was minus gi i bar dw star of x, which after twist become one form dxi and then there was another equation f of zz bar of a plus mu of xx bar 
was zero, and it's actually this is the one. This was wrong. Uh, divide by action of the gauge group. And here, mu and metric G was defined. The mu was a Lie algebra valued moment map for symplectic form coming from Keller metric Gij. And Gii bar was a Keller metric. OK, so now these equations get replaced by this in our particular case of n equal force theory with mass. So the question is, the statement is that now we have integral over the moduli space of solutions of this described by quantum integrable system of n particle sector of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So what solution, what do we know about this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation in n-particle sector. First thing we know about this is that we can exactly solve we can exactly solve the wave function equation h psi equals e psi and this was done I think in 1963 let me make sure I don't misquote the people uh, by Lieb and Liniger and Berezin, Pochil and Finkelberg. As being a Russian, I always have to quote some Russian paper <laughs> in parallel to American paper. So this is Lieb, and Li this is a very famous uh, uh, example. And Berezin, Pochil and Finkelberg. So there actually, there are higher Hamiltonians here. I just wrote only second Hamiltonian. And the higher Hamiltonians are written in terms of something called Dunkel operator. So it turns out that it's not only gauge theory that gives nice formulas for Hamiltonians. They are very similar in parallel formulas in the Schrodinger operator theory for this particular Schrodinger operator that we will need for future to generalize or use. And these are following. So take di as a differential operator on a circle plus i m over 2 sum j equals from i plus 1 to n step function xi minus xj plus 1 times permutation sij. So we have here sij, which is uh, from the while group, permutes positions xi, xj. And we have di, which is a shift deformed with one parameter m. So if that m is not there, this is just a shift. S is, uh, and together, without shift, this would be called affine while group. This while is probably i, right? No? Y. Y is correct, right? Yeah, correct. OK, so this is a deformation now of affine while group and has a name. So we have two generate, two types of generators, this and Sij. And this uh, is called double affine Hecke algebra. at the generation. So there is obviously something which is not degenerate double affine Hecke algebra. And this is a degenerate. Uh, it has only one parameter, m. OK, so claim is all Hamiltonians 
of this integrable system can be written as one half. So this is case Hamiltonian. One half so sum. One at fine here. This is this is you, you're missing multiplication by by the x side to have the, you need dub, to have double f You need both two copies of your commutative algebra. I don't have it. It's degenerate. So only what I have here. So even if it's degenerate, you still need two co commutative subalgebra. So you need multiplication by by variables as well. Uh, you mean by x? Yeah. So I have to add x. You are saying. So multiplication by x, x shift and permutation. Yeah. That's what you are saying. Probably, yeah. But in this discussion, I, I just need what, what I'm saying. But I'm saying that the name of this thing is that see, what I just construct is in the center. That's all I need. And probably, yeah. In terms of f fine, I could not double f fine. Uh, well, one, one parameter deformation of the. Uh, affine um, while group, while algebra, one parameter different. I was told by Ivan Cherednik that this is uh, his Dacha at degeneration. So he claims this is a degenerate Dacha. We, probably I can even formulate in what sense he explains this to me when I get to the uh, more, more, more serious way of describing. Okay, that's what he calls degenerate Dacha. He introduced Dacha, so he, he knows what it is. But important thing is that these guys are in the center, and our H2 is H2. So this H2 is a square, is a one half of sum of di square. And that's what that's what we need. Okay? These will have generalizations when we go to the more complicated example. And then there is a formula for ex explicit uh, wave function, which is common eigenfunction for all of them. Now, watch, I don't take yet on a circle. You see, I wrote a step function. So this one was on a circle, which means it was a periodic one. Now I take it on infinite line. x is on r. R1, and these people I just said, they're Lieb linear and so on, what ex explicit wave function. Explicit wave function of this thing is useful for us in the future discussions, at least in a way Nikita Nekrasov and I explained uh, more complicated systems, and Gerasimov and I explained this particular example. So we take element of the permutation group, we sum over it, we take product of i less than j, sigma of wi minus sigma of wj plus i m step function xi minus xj, which means that see, if we just order them, I don't need this, it's just one, divide by sigma of wi minus sigma of wj times so this is a prefactor, exponential of 2 pi i sum over L sigma W L X L. Okay? So a claim is that this is exact uh, wave function for this um, eigenvalue problem, where the energy is sum sigma i to the power k. So for example, for the h2, just sigma square, sum over sigma squares would be uh, energies, and this is an exact wave function. Okay. Now, where is the beta equation? Before I go to beta equation, I want to write here on this part of the blackboard the normalization. So these are not normalized wave functions under usual measure on R1, which is now R1 to the power n. We have n particles, so the normali normalization is, uh, so we normalize psi sigma 0, psi sigma prime 0 uh, will be integral dx1 dxn 
over Rn of psi bar sigma x 0 psi sigma prime 0 uh, x. And this is not equal to 1. This is equal to some sigma of g. Let me call it product of i equals 1 to n, delta function of sigma minus sigma prime. So up to these factors g, these normalized delta function, normalized wave functions, as it says they're supposed to be. And g of sigma actually is something that will become with familiar already for us. divided by Wandermont. So this normalization eventually will be connected to, to handle gluing operator. See, I have a determinant of two derivatives of W effective, and that will be connected to the. So handle gluing operator will have a meaning of the normalization there. And then the beta equation, which is written here, I explain in a second what it is. So I it is clear that this normalization shows up in the hand and going of it. Now, once we move from here to circle, from the infinite line to circle, we have to request that psi satisfy. periodicity condition if we move by, if we shift x by 1. So when we move to the unit circle. So let me write here psi sigma of x to be normalized 1, which is 1 over square root of g of sigma times psi sigma of 0. And when we put this condition on explicit formula I have written here, it's obvious that you can read everything from here. You shift x by 1. You create from here linear term. And you have this, uh, the log of this one you pull up in the exponential. Uh, uh, this is, by the way, just for simplicity to just later with, this is a piece of S matrix which is written here of this, our model. And we have the log of S matrix as a, as a phase shift. So general statement is replace delta function xi minus xj by periodic delta function, which is sum over an xi minus xj plus n. Request the periodicity from the wave function and see what happens with, um, with the wave function. And the answer is wave function will be periodic if that equation is satisfied. So what we have now is that we have quantum many body system, a simple one, quantum many body system with pairwise delta function interaction on circle. And uh, spectrum is same as on open system plus restriction on rapidities of the beta equation. This is a knowledge that turns out to be extremely important. Yeah, I can't. I, I, please ask me questions if there are any questions, because it's getting harder now. I will make it this story much harder. What I cared was to get to the statement that beta equations in that sense, I mean restriction on a spectrum and so on, is now connected to the periodicity. Okay? Then this periodicity will become harder when we get to more complicated example. But beta equation is related to the periodicity here. And the important question is that this x, which is here, 
is not the same x which was here. See, way uh, we had periodicity, there was a periodicity in this problem also. That's how I got the better equation. I requested periodicity for the monodromy. And I got this quantization P equals N. So I get quantization there from the same requirement. Because what's written here, this equation is nothing more but exponential of uh, I times dW d sigma i equals 1 if I take log of this and move to exponential here. And that w is a Young's function for this integrable system, which has been well known for a long time. So very important open question is, what is the relation between these variables, x, and those variables here? Because in a sense, we know what is the relation between uh, variables dw, d sigma, uh, which, uh, which we have here, and variables uh, which are the sigma. This is the same sigma. So sigmas are the same, but x's are not the same. And this is open question. We just have a coincidence or something like that. That looks like at the moment. Now I want to make an uh, important comment that this uh, representation theory of this, what we called degenerate Daha, or maybe it's not Daha or something like that, is connected to the other things that maybe in later uh, we have to use. And there is a statement. Uh, I'm collecting certain statements to, to use uh, for other problems. And that statement is about. Um, spherical functions and solutions to certain quantum many body systems uh, connected to the representation theory. So this is a, the most simple quantum many body system, at least I understand, that is connected to uh, representation theory of some algebraic object, but this is not unique. There are many others, and now let me describe some of them before I move to the four-dimensional gauge theories and on omega background. So first statement, that that wave function I wrote there has something to do with uh, what's called hull litwood polynomial. Hull-Litwood polynomial itself, as was explained by um, one uh, Dutch mathematician, one Diegen, sorry for, for bad pronunciation, in 2006, uh, Hull-Litwood polynomial itself is a solution to difference version of this problem. So this problem. Uh, can be, uh, instead of second order differential operator, you can write the difference operator of second order, which in the limit becomes this one. So there is a, sometimes this is called the Young Young system, which is probably not correct because it was solved by these people. And the Young and the Young, 1969, Young and his brother, in most famous paper, in the discipline, probably, they, uh, they wrote the beta equation in this philosophy. And this is the same paper where they introduced thermodynamic beta and that. So uh, this Young-Yang system has a discrete generalization. And the hull little polynomial itself, as was shown by this gentleman, is connected to that one. But the one that we are using here is a limit. And let me describe what limit it is. So this Hallitton polynomial is nothing more but GLN QP spherical function.
And there is some explicit form of that, which I probably will not write now, but depends on a bunch of parameter called mu i's, lambda i's, t's, and uh, p. An explicit form is something like take mu1 to mu n to be partition um, of length at most n and let's write it like once we have m1 time and twos we have m2 and so on. And then the function itself of oh, this blackboard killing me. So this is some product over i of 1 minus t uh, divide 1 minus t m power i sum 1 minus minus 1 to the power length of the permutation omega omega permuting these other variables lambda 1 times some product. Okay. So now important statement that eventually I wanted some times ago to generalize it. Looks like it's working. If we go to continue to limit, let's call it um, limit p goes to 1. It's in the products there. Okay, so the pre p in the product, and by the way, not only in the product. No, I have parameter p, and I have mu, which are partitions. I have so parameter n. I have mu, which are like our coordinates eventually, and the p is product here from i one to p. I believe. I am very sorry. And om there is a sum over omega in symmetric group. Anyway, explicit form. Now, that will be important uh, for me later. Explicit form for this is that it has a limit, this Hallitwood polynomial. And that limit is like that. Take mu i's and write is some continuous variable xi divided by epsilon, lambda i's to be exponential of 2 pi epsilon times sigma i, that we need there, and send epsilon to 0, where t, where t is um, exponential of 2 pi i m epsilon, and send epsilon to 0. The claim is that when epsilon goes to zero, this becomes a lib linear wave function. So it explicitly becomes the eigenfunction I described here. That's just when you plug in. This leads to the state. Yes. No, no, no. N is number which we fix. N is number of the particles. We are in n particle sector. So what I wrote, so there is a claim is like this. This equation has its discretized version, okay, which has been studied as also integrable. That discretized version has explicitly hull litwood polynomials, which are the wave functions. Okay, hull litwood polynomials from, from one side are GLN QP zonal spherical functions. So this is the same as what you do when you do the spherical functions, when you do the orbit method. You divide by GLN Z. You take GLN R, divide by, there is its periodic version, which I'm not expert, but see. Explicitly, if you take a formula, and in that formula, you make substitutions such that wave function will become wave function of this operator. Funny way, that substitution also takes P to goes to 1. So P is exponential of epsilon. So basically what you do, like we usually do, you take this function, analytically continue everywhere it's possible, take this substitution, and take limit epsilon goes to 0. We will be playing these limits later. That's why I am 
I'm discussing it here. And this becomes uh, the solution to that. Okay? This leads to the some kind of um, picture which motivated um, Nikita Nekrasov and me to do next thing that we I will be talking from now on. And this is following. That blackboard needs to be fixed, actually. So let's take what we know about our. Uh, so let's take situation with three fermions. So this would be two-dimensional young mills without any Hitchin system that I've been describing here. So when there is no phi, when uh, I answered some Thibault's question here. When we turn on one parameter, which is um, this parameter will introduce Higgs field, or we turn on the parameter m, we somehow go to nonlinear Schrodinger system on one side. There is another way of deforming that one, and this is now what becomes point for me, which is called Calogero Moser. Sutherland deformation. This is now this was connected to the delta function potential, or let's say one parameter m. This connects to deformation with one over sinh square potential. Again, I mean, this is all I'm discussing now on infinite line, no periodicity conditions or something like that. So we deform it like that. And then there is another one, which is, um, I cannot write this, Ru E Nars deformation, the one more one, and uh, uh, the, uh, this one has two parameters. Let me call it Q and the T. This corresponds to Q. So Ruginar system is um, a relativistic version of the Calogero Moser Sutherland. So this is non-relativistic many quantum many body system. There is its relativist generalization. This not Im most, most, most important here is existence of it rather than what it is. And the nonlinear Schrodinger one, which is standing here, this young young system or lieb linear system, is Q equals zero for this two parameter family. Kaluger Moser Sutherland is Q equals T to the power nu, where the nu is a coefficient in front of potential here. And then you have to send Q to one, simultaneously you have to send T to one. So it will have this one parameter left. And that would be Kaloger Sutherland model, Moser. And that's there is a picture. And what in this picture we detected first doing um, uh, the uh, calculation for Higgs bundle for uh, yeah, uh, Higgs in moduli space, which was this equation divided by gauge group, turned out to be that corner. So this particular one. That's all I needed from the picture was that the, uh, th this is this one parameter one, and there is another piece of it. Now, if I go back to this equation, I want to describe two interesting limits of this equation. And one interesting one, which is to the point, and this somehow it's kind of a little awkward, is not m goes to zero limit, but rather m goes to infinity limit. So when m goes to infinity, this is actually a quasi-classical limit for this model. It's not m goes to zero, which is quasi-classical limit, but when m goes to infinity. When go m goes to infinity, this becomes minus 1 to the power n. And you have a statement that the exponential of i sigma j is equal minus 1 to the power n. And this is a free fermion point, that one. When m goes to zero limit, 
Now, I explain why it's actually also true. See, when m goes to infinity limit, this phi, this field phi, which is Higgs field, for which m was a mass, is infinitely massive. And in quantum field theory, where this is a matter field, it decouples. So this theory becomes without. Mass goes to zero limit is a bad limit because that guy becomes massless. And once big bang massless, you cannot integrate it out. So free fermion point is m goes to infinity limit when phi decouples and we get in two-dimensional young mill story of Ed Witten. When m goes to zero limit, what we get is that this he, uh, uh, Hitchin system equivalently as a manifold, uh, the solution to this equation, the space of solutions, can be equivalently described as a flat connection for connection i plus a plus i phi equals zero divided by complexification of the gauge group. So these two spaces are the same, and in one second for physics I explained why these two spaces are the same takes this equation. This equation is now complex let connection. It's invariant under complexification of gauge group. So gauge group here has a unitary directions and the complex direction. So you have to gauge fix to study this kind of equation. And you can always gauge fix by imposing the condition. So yeah. So here what we have, this equation f z z bar a plus a is, is the same as this equation. As a real part, as an imaginary part, is this equation plus complex conjugate. Okay? If you take a real part of that equation, you get this. If you take imaginary part, you get this plus complex conjugate. You have to gauge fix, and you can introduce gauge fixing to be nabla phi minus nabla bar and then they're equivalent. So if we wish gauge fixing part of the gauge transformations makes this equal that. This is simple physics explanation why these two systems are the same. And mass equals to zero limit when we take mass of this guy phi equal to zero gives us nothing more but integration over this moduli space where phi is massless. But this is uh, ill-defined because the moduli space of the complex flat connection is non-compact. So the integrals will diverge. And the point where we introduced mass for phi was that we would make the bad direction in the complex direction to be regularized by putting the Gaussian exponential of minus mass phi phi bar, and that would converge. So m goes to zero limit is bad. So if Ed Witten's calculation for a flat connection, the real flat connection, was that it was sum over irreducible representations of um, gauge group, so Witten, I think it was 1988, that this is sum over EREPS of gauge group G. Um, now this becomes questionable because G is replaced by GC. It's a complex complexification of the gauge group. And what is summed up also is infinite. So in some paper I wrote with Gerasimov, uh, we explained uh, uh, my calculations with Nekrasov and Moore from 1998 in this language. So m goes to zero limit is bad. Uh, there is some explanation of that. Now, what about people who studied beta equations? What do they say? Well, they say that m goes to infinity limit is uh, equivalent to h bar goes to zero limit. So it is. Uh, it is a good one. Sorry, what I'm saying. No. Uh, the m goes to zero limit. That's what they say. Uh, this is what Fedya Smirnov taught me. When m goes to zero, you have to send n to infinity, such that some combination is finite. I, I, I forgot. Well, probably m times n is finite. I, I, I don't remember. And then this is the semi-classical limit. So semi-classic is not that obvious. And then this, when n goes to infinity limit, and what I describe actually gets very complicated and is connected to the infinite genus Riemann surface. But when m goes to infinity limit, this has an extremely well-studied uh, solution that you take 
when m goes to infinity, first solution will be sigma j's are one half times integers. And then you perturb around it, and there is a very nice perturbation theory in 1 over m. And the theorem has been proven that for every set of integers, ordered set of integers, there is exactly one solution for sigma 1, sigma n. So this is what they call completeness. Since the set of integers, ordered set of integers, let's call it ni's, such that n1 is more than so n n, describes highest weight reducible representation of a unitary group. What is claimed here that for every highest weight representation of a unitary group, there is a solution for this equation. So this is a case when it's well studied and it has these various limits. Now, what about going um, to the other picture, which was a picture of the function? So I wrote there that there was a hull litwood polynomial that was relevant in epsilon goes to zero limit. How that picture and this picture connects that I, I wrote on this blackboard? They do connect very well. Again, the people who study this kind of McDonald's polynomials know that. So the, on the top, you have something which is called McDonald's polynomial. Depends on two parameters, q and t. Now I move the blackboard and it will be clear. When q goes to zero limit, this becomes hull -Lithwood. And t equals 1 over p for McDonald. Here, that exact limit we had, q equals t to the power nu, q goes to 1, t goes to 1. It becomes Jack polynomial. Here, when t goes to 0 limit, this becomes three fermion, or sure, sure functions, which are the class functions for uh, representation of the unitary groups. Excuse me? Uh, the, uh, it's the sin which has the, the jump polynomial. Sinch. Sign? Well, this, as you, as you will see in a second in my talk, that I don't much distinguish, but th th this is one is analytic. Um, so these pictures now map one to one. So the McDonald will, will be relevant for this and so on. But what is missing from this picture? is when uh, we instead of this one or this one, we consider it elliptic versions. So this was a situation when, let's say, on the levels the way that we were working. So I can ask you first. At, at the McDonald level, are you saying you have a beta onset to produce McDonald's polynomial? We will, we will do better than that. We will produce, OK. Question is two-sided. First, if you ask me to construct the wave functions, right? Second, if you ask me to construct the spectrum of the quantum integrable system. Now, usually, you would say that, oh, you cannot construct the spectrum without giving me a wave function, so like we did here. I presented the lieb linear calculation of wave function. Then I take the periodicity and produce the discrete spectrum. So what you would expect is that the way I would now proceed for the McDonald's and everything, I will produce this version, which would lead to the beta equation, which would cover entire blackboard over there. Instead of that, what I will do first, I will eventually get to that. But first, what I will do, looking on these examples, I will try to find the quantum field theory for each corner of that diagram that comes from my way of describing the quantum integrable system. So I will construct supersymmetric young mill theory, which will have the vacuum described by, by all means by some quantum integrable systems that I know what it is. And that quantum integrable system will have uh, description in terms of twist effective superpotential, so by beta equation, or Baxter equation. Remember, I had two sets. First was, I said that vacuum are given by effective twisted superpotential, and second, I said that there is a vacuum identity, including Baxter operators. So I have both languages. So in one of those languages, I will detect 
which quantum integrable system I get. And then the other formula will give me a spectrum. Now, it will be produced without giving the wave function first. And then people would complain. I mean, how can you make such strong statement without actually presenting the wave function? But I will say that, the, sorry, if I properly formulate the question, then spectrum is independent in which coordinates you write the wave function. Only statement will be that I look in this kind of Hilbert space, and here is a spectrum without giving wave function. But unfortunately, because people ask questions like this, and they are sometimes very unpleasant, and I don't mean questions, I mean people, we had to produce the wave function. So we would approximate the wave function somehow and argue that there is a wave function which can be calculated this and this way and will give that spectrum. And we will do that for entire diagram. Yeah, we will do that for entire diagram. But at the moment I say I want to consider elliptic version of this where Sutherland will be a limit. So elliptic one will contain Sutherland as a limit. Okay? There will be elliptic Rusinas one which will contain Rusinas as a limit. Everybody knows that Rusinas has something to do with McDonald and all these limits. Okay? But what I will produce, I will produce elliptic version of this thing with exact spectrum and I will verify that this is exact spectrum in some correct Hilbert space. That correct Hilbert space will be defined in terms of differential equations. This, is, this logic is extremely important. If this logic is not understood, uh, uh, the everything crashes. I, unfortunately, I fail. I had had hard times with my teachers who would tell me that, oh, no, no, we are the expert. Nofadev said that, you know, I, write, I wrote books when I was young about these things and so on. Well, what is the problem that you are solving? And after long discussions and long discussion, eventually understood what are the problems that I am solving. So it, it needs, look what happened here. I, without constructing the wave function, okay, this wave function, saying that integration over the moduli space of Hitchin system set up in such a way as given by n equal 4 super young mill theory in two dimensions with a super potential, uh, th uh, bare super potential one half sigma square would produce the exact spectrum of this quantum mechanical system well, th this one, quantum mechanical system, co common eigenfunctions and so on, I predicted. I did not calculate it, but then happened that it actually gave it correctly. I even formulated the question that these coordinates in which the wave function is written here in the Young-Young system, or the Lieb-Linegar system, is unnatural from the point of view of the gauge theory, because gauge theory likes to write the wave functions in terms of the uh, uh, monodromies of the gauge field. Luckily, in the case of the sure, in the sure case there, when we have few fermions, this turns out to be same coordinates. This x size here and that x size in the case of the um, um, uh, uh, characters of the representation of the unitary group are the same. But once you leave, once you depart, once you turn that, co uh, that parameter mass, which was a twisted mass, which I said also was equivalent parameter for a global group, and I turned it on, they depart. And this is an open question, is not understood how. In this case, we know everything and we verify conjecture that the gauge theory calculations of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the chiral ring operators actually do produce correct spectrum in a correct Hilbert space of corresponding uh, integrable system. Okay, so in, in my view, being a person working in a gauge theories, I would say you have to be insane not to believe that this will work for every case. As long as I identify what is my quantum integrable system, you have to be really retrograde. In Russian they say, I don't know, the person who doesn't believe in progress, that this is not uh, going to give the right answer. But regretfully, as I said, Nekrasov and I had to verify that we actually had to solve elliptic calogero moser equation order by order and verify that our statement is true order by order. Of course, we solved it uh, up to very few orders, like three or four, but it does give the right answer. Okay? So let me now move 
to the most interesting part of probably my lectures is that see, once we determined quantum many body system, you see I, I described this corner here. So I'm sorry I didn't describe very well this how Litwood polynomials, which is not the, my expertise, uh, but that's the complete matching of these blackboards. I moved here and jumped immediately to elliptic case because elliptic case covers everything and hint comes for this from um, four-dimensional zyberg wittensauer So now, the models which are written on that blackboard in the right-hand side, it's um, uh, uh, those models in finite size situation correspond to some other our friends discovered correspond to zyberg wittensauer so I have to move to zyberg wittensauer so from now on, two-dimensional uh, uh, models, toroidal compactifications and so on will disappear and we move to four-dimensional super young mills and algebraic integrable systems. So in about 1995, um, Gorsky, uh Mironov, Marozov, and Marshakov, and um, Martinik and Warner, and then Donaghy and Wheaton, gave very beautiful explanation of connection of zyberg witten solution of super young mills or in for, uh, n equals two super young mills in 4D and algebraic classical algebraic integrable systems that I need to review. I have 10 minutes left so I will just introduce the basic notions and we will be done. I will erase that thing. So Zyberg and Witten in 1994 found a uh, beautiful low energy solution to super young mill theory in four dimensions with eight supercharges. So theory with eight supercharges in four dimension is uh, kind of closest cousin of theory we discussed uh, in two dimensions. So we have n equal to 4D super young mills and uh, it has a property that in perturbation theory, it is one loop exact. So anything uh, in coupling constant, pertur well, if, if there is a coupling constant, but once there is a perturbation theory, there are eight supercharges in four dimensions. Perturbation theory is one loop exact. So then you have one loop perturbation theory plus instantons. Plus instantons. And even better news is that the, because of this high number of supersymmetry, there are no anti-instantons. Remember when instantons came to life, uh, it was clear that situation is very complicated. You have instantons, you have anti instantons, they interact with each other, there is a complicated mess. And it was Fatev and Schwartz, Fatev, Rollo, and Schwartz, uh, who calculated in the late 70s some answers using the instantons and anti instantons, summing them up in um, uh, sigma models in two dimensions and recovered the correct answers, but that w which showed that in order to get correct answers, you have to do all these complicated interactions between them. Now, in n equal to theory, there are no, uh, either there are instantons or anti-instantons, but they are not together, and they are because of holomorphicity. That's long argument to run, but it's not important for us. What is important, that observation 
of the guys. So uh, low energy effective action exactly like in 2D W effective produced low energy effective action in 4D it's another thing which is called the prepotential now in uh, in two dimensions, we had one invariant function, which we call W effective, and we had to construct two form out of it. So W effective was invariant function on the Lie algebra of the gauge group, and we had this procedure of uh, descent procedures that we would take this invariant function, act by derivative, its Q of something, and so on, and produce two forms. So in four dimensions, for this kind of theories, claim is you need to know one holomorphic function on Cartan of the Lie algebra of the gauge group, one invariant under the permutation, blah, 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 function, which is holomorphic, because the, here also um, the scalar in a vector multiplet is complex uh, uh, field. One function, which is meromorphic actually, and you have to construct 4-4. And this is effective uh, Lagrangian. So effective action, exactly like in two dimensions, which was a two form descending from the effective twisted superpotential, descends with from one object, which is called the prepotential, cyborg written prepotential, under the descent procedure. So D of F is Q of something, and you repeat four times and get a four form. You don't need to know this, I mean, it's so trivial. Uh, just the concept is important. Okay, so now claim is, and exactly like here in two-dimensional n equal two theory, we had to calculate from UV theory, we had to calculate W effective. Here, from UV theory, you have to calculate uh, F of A. That's a calculation. But whatever you do, there will be F. Whatever theory you take, there will be F. Here, whatever theory you would take, there will be W effective. Very similar. What these guys observed, and here I finish on it, that this F of Zyberg Witten has meaning in classical algebraic integrable systems, classical, it's very important, classical, and it's also called their prepotential. So we have a statement, there was a quantum field theory in four dimensional calculation, led to some one holomorphic meromorphic function, f of a, zyberg witten described it, and so on, and these people mentioned, noticed, that this prepotential has a very geometric meaning in a classical Hamiltonian systems, complex algebraic Hamiltonian systems. And when I come, I will start with this, and I will uh, show that uh, the one of the examples these people had of the complex algebraic integrable system is a limit of this elliptic version of what I wrote here, this particular limit. Which means that if I know that f of a there, I can identify with elliptic version of whatever is written here. And then I can ask question, very similar to what I was asking before, that instead of considering these theories on a cylinder times torus, where I said that they would read to x, y, z version, and when Vasya said that if we would do on sigma, we will get something interesting. So instead of doing that, I will consider these theories on a cylinder times simple omega background, R2 with epsilon, which is nothing more but the generalization of Kalusa-Klein reduction instead of the affine shifts, we do the rotation. 
So we will consider theories on that. And the claim will be that epsilon will be quantization of this classical algebraic integrable system where epsilon equals h bar in some form. So by turning on that uh, epsilon there, I will calculate spectrum of answers here. That's the philosophy. And I explained where it came from. So next two and a half hours, I will be doing examples uh, of this for two particular cases of Hitchin system. I never said that Hitchin system, which was on the blackboard here, had anything to do with the integrable system. But then I will start with this, that the, there is a classical integrable system associated to, the, uh, to this uh, phase space, uh, so model A space of solutions to here. And then I will consider two particular examples, which will be elliptical Ogero Moser and um, periodic Toda, which is elliptical Ogero Moser is the elliptic generalization of this, where I play between sine square and sin square, and that's what Didin asked me. So I will solve it, and I will answer questions like what Paul was asking me for this. So I will solve it in a sense that I will produce first exact formula for spectrum, which will be expansion in the in, in exponential of minus period, so the parameter. And that expansion will coincide with the instant on expansion here. So there is, as I said, instant on corrections, one loop and instant on correction. Instant on corrections will be exactly the expansion since the exponential of minus size, minus period here. They will coincide, and I will observe that these two things coincide, and I will make, uh, so this is about wave function. Then I will make general statement that it's always true and derive Baxter equation. And this will end up with some paper we wrote with Vasya, which is very general and in that language. So we will depart from the language of the beta equations. We will move to the language of Baxter equation. So we will get the Baxter equation for these systems, by the way, which some of them have been unknown. <laughs> okay, And the meaning of the Baxter equations for us will be the statement that there is an order parameter in quantum field theory, which is the determinant of x minus this scalar field or something, which we have in the world multiple. And then that, that guy will satisfy the word identity. And that word identity uh, will not be word identity in the sense that I don't know for which transformation it is produced, but it's an identity. And that will allow to determine to what Baxter equation we are dealing with. And gauge theory will give it with a solution. And those gauge theories, which will be like this, will not give me any more the polynomial solutions. It will, they will give me certain analytic uh, solutions. An analytic property will be determined by asymptotics of the Baxter operator that can be calculated on gauge theory in the asymptotics in all possible ways of turning on and turning off the parameters. And we will describe that space. And if I hopefully I get to it, but the, for me the important think is to run this logic that we first get this, then we get that. When we look at this, then we go to elliptic, then we go to generic, and then we look back uh, what's happening and we will realize that on the way lots of interesting questions will not be answered. In particular, the question of the perfect meaning of this um, Yangian function will not be answered and it's an open question. Thank you very much.